one movie that I loved uh, that did get attention, but in more indie side was a movie called Stakeland that Jim Mickle directed. And it's one of the most uh, intimate, beautiful movies I think I've done in the horror world. And I took that because I hadn't done a movie with like zombie vampires. Yeah. So I was like, I've never done a movie with zombie vampires. Let me take a look. And I was like, ooh, this is bigger than that. And you know what, Danielle? Who are we to argue? When looking for a best horror movie you never saw, nothing in our completely made up rule book says that a movie can't be well received at the time of its release. It can even win awards, including one from the audiences that saw it at TIFF and then just kind of go away. You miss the heart, you dumb shit. There are a ton of movies that are great and original films in a genre that is nearly as obsessed with sequels and movie universes as DC and Marvel. Stakeland is an original piece of media that is one part Walking Dead, one part The Road, and altogether one of the best horror movies you never saw. Stakeland was destined to be a movie that few had seen, as its theatrical run produced about $33,000 in theaters, but in an era of physical media and streaming services, even as early as 2010 and 2011, the movie, which was written by both star Nick DiMici and director Jim Mickle, was designed as a short web series that they could produce on weekends and release it on their own terms. They presented over three dozen eight-minute scripts to indie horror or mega producer Larry Fassenden and his glass eye picks who suggested it to be turned into a feature. As a mentor to Mickle, he was able to help produce and give them notes as production went along. To that end, they did end up producing seven prequel webisodes that would be released leading up to and alongside the movie to build both hype and a nice little world that feels very lived in. Mickle got noticed for his entry in the Eight Films to Die For series that was released in 2007 for the After Dark Horror Fest. These were also released at Blockbuster, and I remember running through all of them. His flick Mulberry Street, which he wrote with Dimitri and who stars in it again, is probably the best of that batch that came out. He also directed Cold in July, We Are What We Are, and episodes of Happen Leonard as well as Sweet Tooth, mostly with Dimitri writing and or making an appearance on screen. The movie opens with one of our leads, Martin, telling us in flashback form about the end of both the world at large and his world on a micro level. I would love to get some confirmation on if this character was named after Romero's underseen vampire movie of the same name. Somebody hit up Dimitri or Mikkel for me, please. Thank you. Martin is played by Connor Paolo, who first showed up as a young Sean in Clint Eastwood's Mystic River. He's also showed up heavily in shows like Gossip Girl and Revenge, as well as more than a few movies including Stakeland 2, which we will touch on a little later, as well as some other titles you may have seen. We see why he's with Dimitri's character, as both his parents and even baby sibling is murdered by what we learn is the reason for the apocalypse. Vampires. The movie is uncompromising in its violence and who it decides to kill. When a horror movie decides to kill a baby in the first seven minutes, you know they aren't fucking around. This world is also effectively over, and we are told of the busier cities being ravaged, cults taking shape across the country, and the US falling hard and fast. The first ten minutes of the movie tell you everything you need to know about the story. We see different kinds of vampires, how you need to protect yourself, and a warning about society as a whole, or, you know, what's left of it. Dimitri plays Mr. with the attitude and hardened charisma that I have come to expect and love from him. I spoke about him in my most recent video about other underseen movie late phases, and I am a fan of this guy right here. He takes Martin under his wing and teaches him how to survive, but also how to take out vampires, which greatly outnumber humans. We watch them go through settlements and barter while Mr. takes care of his base urges and watch them save stragglers. See, Mr. doesn't care if you're a vampire or a crazy cult human. He kills with the same efficiency and the same lack of remorse. The first of these people they save is played by Kelly McGillis. Yeah. That one. 
from Top Gun, The Witness, and a whole heap of other memorable roles. Like many of the apocalyptic movies of the time, including the aforementioned The Road, the movie focuses more heavily on how bad the survivors can be rather than the threat itself. The nice thing is, it still feels as fresh here as it did when it came out. This was before every single movie of this type fell into the same specific trope. Even The Walking Dead just had to keep coming back to it. But here, it works because of budgetary constraints where you can have battles with culty D-bags rather than have to show off special effects and makeup so that you can have vampires throughout. Again, this gives the movie a nice world-building feel. By the time we get to the damn near required Larry Fessenden cameo, here as the bartender who gives Martin his first drink, we have seen how life is. <laughs> We've also seen some great scenes of tension like when Martin and Mister are stuck in their own car after escaping the Brotherhood cult. It has good direction and storytelling and allows for a near budgetless set piece that also gives us a fun action scene. Also, in the bar we get the appearance of the movie's biggest fan, Danielle Harris. Danielle Harris plays Belle, a younger pregnant woman who wants to get somewhere safe to have her baby. She is wonderful here as we've come to expect from her in everything that she shows up in. Her and her podcast partner and close friend Scout Taylor Compton are the best parts of the Rob Zombie Halloween remake duology. I also have a personal horror love for her as Halloween 5 was one of the first VHS tapes that I bought with my own money from Blockbuster Music of all places. I fully forgot forgive her for getting Cory to cheat on Topanga with her, and if you're a Boy Meets World fan, you know what I mean. The trio work their way towards the haven of New Eden, and we get introduced to things called scamps, which are younger kid vampires, because this movie has already set the precedent that age does not protect you. This is an excellent example of just how they use their budget and keep things interesting while doing many of the things that movies of this type would do. They pick up our final main character character, a military man named Willie, who was also left as bait for vampires by the Brotherhood. He gives us some more exposition and story building about the Brotherhood using the vampires as weapons and expediting the process of ending the world. The group works its way to New Eden, and I'm amazed at how this movie was made for just over 600 k It isn't acted that way, directed that way, shot that way, or even with special effects and makeup that would suggest just that low of a budget. At just over an hour and a half, the movie moves at a very brisk pace. The score, which echoes the road and is more contemplative than exciting by Jeff Grace, is done wonderfully and fits the film to a T. It keeps surprises coming and even though you know not everyone is gonna make it out alive, it's still surprising how and when. While it may not have been a blockbuster like movies from the Saw or Final Destination franchise, it would be popular enough to warrant a sequel with Stakeland 2, The Stakelander. Which, yeah, I know, that title. But it's fun. While director and co-writer Jim Mickle didn't want or wasn't able to come back, the Sci-Fi Channel had the good sense to get Nick DiMici back to write and show up again in some capacity. Between the prequel web series and the two movies, this property got life to it that few would have expected from a little indie movie that could. Danielle said it was a tough shoot in the cold of upstate of New York with very few lines, but there was something that drew her to it, and it was a very rewarding experience. Plus, who could resist zombie-like vampire creatures and a title like Stakeland? That's exactly what this movie does to you upon watching it. It has a very personal feel with all the characters involved and gets your buy-in on them in very little time. A movie like this is special because of the people who worked on it fully buying in and believing what it could be, and that translates into how the audience views it. Stakeland takes classic ideas such as vampires or the inherited evil of humanity and packages it into a very consumable 98 minutes.
But what I truly love about the movie is that it truly is a best horror movie that you never saw. It gets to be handed down from those lucky enough to watch it and then those new viewers get to do the same. It's like I tell my kids as each one finds out that Santa isn't real. It's their job now to become the jolly gift giver to their younger siblings. It's shocking with how much legs the series had that it's still not as widely talked about and even Demichi, who apparently is a walking best horror movie you never saw factory, has other things that people recognize him for. If Danielle Harris, who isn't even the star here and has a litany of other movies to think of and talk about with people, feels that this one is one of her least discussed but best films that she's made then do yourself a favor and seek it out. You can find it often on Tubi or pick yourself up a copy on physical media. We here at Joe Blow Horror completely agree that you should cross this off your best horror movie you never saw, and then hand it down to the next person.